and a 10, 8 Ant-Man, Mary Jane. Okay, so technically this is Spider-Man, but it's a zombie version of Spider-Man, but I'm gonna count it anyway because this is pretty damn messed up, zombie or not. On Earth 2149, an alien plague ends up infecting all superpowered individuals and turns them into zombies. However, it's later revealed that the Necronomicon from Evil Dead was actually what caused it. But after learning that the plague was actually like a bad thing, Peter ran home to get Ant-Man MJ the hell out of Dodge. But when he gets there, we get a good old case of protagonist syndrome and boom! Zombie Spider. He ends up becoming a zombie and eats the two most important people in his life. He also had a fractured job before becoming a zombie, so I'm sure you can imagine that this isn't a pretty sight, even by zombie standards. It may not be RP, but it was a version of Spider-Man, so it's fine. And at 9, Anna Marconi. Speaking of a version of Spider-Man, let's discuss the Superior Spider-Man and his fascination with Anna Marconi. Superior Spider-Man is actually Otto Octavius, who prior to the Superior Spider-Man storyline had brain swapped with Peter, yet a piece of Peter still remained in his own body, which convinced Otto to end up becoming a hero, albeit a darker one. Doc Ock was up to some really shady stuff while pretending to be Peter. Cause you know, since Peter is young, handsome, in shape, and has actual women in his life, Otto tried his luck at getting MJ to sleep with him, but failed miserably. So you know, things weren't going that well. But then there's Anna Marconi, whom this Otto-Peter hybrid started dating. She had no idea what the real situation was going on inside that noggin, and while it's unclear if they ever actually hopped on the good foot and did the bad thing, it's obvious that things were at least heading in that direction. Otto was in love with her, which was a surprise since he even decided to give Peter back his body to save her. But it was still an absolutely horrific story, immoral, in the highest class of the word. It's creepy as hell and it makes me rethink all relationships. And it ain't interfered with surgery. In the same series as the Anna Marconi situation, the small bit of Peter that was left in his body was trying to regain control, for obvious reasons, because, you know, a super villain was piloting his bone mech with meat armor. This small bit of Peter, though, was at times able to interfere or even control Otto temporarily. One of these moments came in Superior Spider-Man number eight, where there was a device that was capable of wiping Pete from Otto's brain, but to get it, he had to perform surgery on a little girl. However, Peter didn't think that Otto could do it, so he tries to stop Otto from even performing the surgery. While he has his Spider-Man mask on, may I add, and an additional face mask. So if evil Spider-Man can do it, so can you. Even still, trying to prevent the surgery to save a little girl's life is a pretty low moment for the barnacle, even if it was filled with good intentions. Kind of. Those only power crystals, you know. <laughs> Actually, is that how it works? I don't know. I don't I don't think like Topaz is gonna cure my depression or something. And in seven, scarring Harry Osborne. While Spider-Man 3 in and of itself is one of the most despicable things that Spider-Man has done, well, with the exception of that sweet dance scene. One of the most horrible things actually in the movie is during the final fight between Harry and Peter. Peter shows up at Harry's house wearing the black symbiote costume and is mad about Goblin Jr. being the reason that MJ left Peter. However, this fight is about more than that, since Harry still blames Peter for killing his father, and Peter is done trying to convince him. After wailing on him a little bit, Peter kicks Harry into the path of a rogue glider, sending him flying into a shelf of good old fashioned pumpkin bombs. After some mental torment, he knocks Harry out against the wall, at least so he thinks, but in fact, Harry is awake, and as Peter is walking away, Harry decides to chuck a pumpkin bomb at Pete, who dodges it thanks to his spider sense, but then thanks to the symbiote throws it back at Harry, causing it to explode basically right next to his face. If it weren't for the goblin serum, Harry would definitely be dead, and honestly, even with it, I'm surprised that he survived. But you do have to admit, it was pretty damn cold. But. Harry also did kind of deserve it. And at six, assorted killings. For being a hero that has a strict no killing rule, Spider-Man has killed quite a few people, but perhaps most notably Logan's friend Charlie in the graphic novel Spider-Man vs. Wolverine from 1987. The plot of this is that both Wolverine and Spidey end up in Berlin for their own reasons and as the title suggests, Wolverine and Spider-Man end up fighting each other, in a graveyard to be exact. The fight is actually a good one, with Spidey even having the mindset to kill Wolverine because Logan might kill him first. They don't know each other that well at this point. The fight ends only when a helicopter of bad guys shows up looking for Logan's friend Charlie. Wolverine wanted to help his friend stop killing, but now since this helicopter showed up, Wolverine wants to kill her quick, since, you know, they aren't going to. Which he doesn't actually have to do because Spider-Man does. After Charlie intentionally sets off his spider sense and gets a super powered spider punch to the face, killing her instantly. Halfway through into number five, kissed Gwen's daughter. After learning that your father isn't actually your father, but rather your mother's ex who she cheated on with his worst enemy, what do you think you would do? Also, you're aging more rapidly because your real father has some form of goblin serum in his system that somehow passed on to you, but you only age up physically, so you're mentally 10 with the body of an adult. 
Yeah, you may want to skip this number. Since Pete and Sarah end up getting closer after fighting off dealers in Paris, but this was made even worse when they're in Paris without MJ, who Peter didn't bring for whatever reason. The thing is though, Peter thinks that this is entirely platonic. <laughs> this just goes to show you that if your partner thinks that someone's trying to get with you, you should listen. Because lo and behold, Sarah ends up planting one on her almost dad, just as MJ shows up for a surprise visit. And I think the name of the storyline, Sins Remembered, is way too fitting and is definitely going to be seared into my brain now. God damn it. You thought that Gwen and Green Goblin was bad? Oh boy. <laughs> and it four sold his marriage. After siding with Tony in the events of the first Civil War, Spider-Man has to reveal his identity to the world in order to continue fighting crime. And you know, since now every supervillain on Earth knows how to get to Spider-Man, Kingpin ends up attacking Peter at his home. He dodges the bullets, but they end up hitting Aunt May instead, putting her in critical condition. This is the start of the One More Day storyline, probably the most universally hated Spider-Man run of all time. Since in order to save Aunt May, Peter talks to Mephisto and ends up selling his marriage to MJ in order to save his aunt. So their entire marriage will get erased so that he can have at least one more day with his aunt. Aside from living with the consequences of your actions, because you know, that's not what heroes do. Which is also pretty goddamn horrible. You want to know what else is pretty goddamn horrible? Like MJ had to agree to it as well, or at least she had to say that she did. But like seriously, if you're being realistic, okay, how many years does Aunt May really have left? Okay? like. L honestly, not many. So selling your marriage to, to bring back your one foot in the grave aunt just seems like a not so even trade to me. I'm just, I'm just saying. MJ's gonna be around for longer. You heard it right ladies, I'd let my old aunt die for you. Hit me up. <laughs> Getting close to the end into number three, One Moment in Time. The One Moment in Time story comes after the One More Day story, and this seems to be the storyline that No Way Home is taking inspiration from. However, after saving Aunt May, Wilson Fisk ends up sending a hitman after MJ's Aunt Anna Watson, but the hitman, revealed to be Eddie Brock, ends up attacking Mary Jane. Peter takes the wounded MJ to Doctor Strange who heals her, but Peter also insists that Doctor Strange performs a spell that causes everyone to forget that he's Spider-Man, because again, not living with the consequences of his actions. Strange contacts Iron Man and Mr. Fantastic for advice, and they end up agreeing with him eventually. They do, however, decide that nobody should remember who Peter is aside from Peter. Not Doctor Strange, not Tony, not Mr. Fantastic, not MJ. But Peter, being Peter, jumps out of his protective bubble and grabs MJ and pulls her in before the spell is complete. They wake up in a motel and Peter explains what happened. Mary Jane asks why he couldn't just let her forget, and then she explains that she can't be with him because it's only a matter of time before somebody rips off his mask again and they go after her family, and that's a danger that she can't let happen. Back in the present though, Mary Jane also explains that he has to move on and find somebody who can be with him. Should have just let her forget it, man. Penultimately, in a number two, hit Mary Jane. To get things straight, I understand that finding out that you're actually a clone and that the real Peter Parker has been living his life for the past few years as Ben Riley because he thought he was the clone would be pretty earth shattering, but nonetheless, it doesn't excuse this behavior. You may be under a lot of stress, but you never hit or take it out on your partner in any way whatsoever. No matter what gender you are or aren't, you just don't, okay? But Peter didn't get that memo for a minute, since in the Clone Wars storyline after finding this out, Peter and Ben are in the middle of a scrap. Mary Jane admittedly doesn't make the brightest move though when she attempts to break the two up, but Peter instinctively backhands her across the room, a moment we see referenced in Spider-Man 3 in the cafe that MJ works at. However, in the comic, Mary Jane was actually currently pregnant with his child, and while Peter does instantly regret this and is filled with shame and guilt, he runs away. He doesn't check on his pregnant wife. He flees and joins up with Jackal, so yeah. Not the finest moment there, dude. Finally, in a number one, killed Mary Jane. I know I say I hate talking about this, but honestly, if I have to suffer through this knowledge, so does everyone else. It's like my own way of being a supervillain. In the Spider-Man Reigns storyline, it's revealed that Mary Jane is dead, but it's also revealed later on why she's dead, since she was married to Peter, and as I've mentioned, did eventually want to have kids with him. The thing is though, a radioactive spider bite in your hand does more to a man than lets him stick to walls and perform incredible acrobatics. It also fills that man with radiation, and anything else he fills also gets filled with radiation, if you catch my drift. Whether you're role playing a lab experiment or not, that's what ended up happening after all, since Mary Jane ends up dying of cancer thanks to the radiation that Peter was packing in those swimmers. Yeah, it's absolutely horrible and while yes, it's a question that everyone had, 
It's not something we ever wanted an answer to, especially if this is the way that it was gonna go. Coming in at number 10, we have the disfigurement of the tragic villain known only as Bootface. Batman is infamous for having a strict rule against killing any of the henchmen or villains he often fights against, but that doesn't stop him from doing some major damage, and no one shows that off clearer than Bootface. A former criminal who made the extremely unfortunate choice to try and attack Batman with a flamethrower, Bootface was permanently scarred when his flamethrower malfunctioned, and Batman kicked him in the face during the fire, grafting the imprint of Batman's boot directly on Bootface's, well, face. Bootface would return as part of a group of similarly injured villains that wanted revenge on Batman for permanently altering the course of their lives, and while it could be argued that maybe these guys shouldn't have been living a life of crime in the first place, it still is pretty messed up just how far Batman is willing to go, even if he's technically not breaking his no killing rule. Coming in at number 9, we have the time that Batman made Robin dig his own grave. Yes, the Silver Age of comics has more than its fair share of wild moments, but few can probably compare to the cover image of Jimmy Olsen and Robin being forced to literally dig their own graves while Batman wields a Tommy gun. Now, apparently the actual story behind this cover is because Batman has lost his memory and been convinced that he's actually a member of the Mafia. While Superman still retained his sense of self, he had to pretend to go along with the Mafia Act until he was finally able to return Batman's memories, but not before likely traumatizing Robin and Jimmy Olsen for life by making them dig their own graves at gunpoint. Coming in at number 8, we have the time that Batman launched a villain into space. Once again, Batman's no killing rule was placed under a bit of stress when Batman Incorporated's Japanese division found itself under attack by the immortal supervillain Lord Deathman, a bad guy that was even able to resurrect himself from having his corpse thrown into a literal volcano. Outraged at the destruction that Deathman had caused, Batman's solution was a fate even worse than death, locking the villain within an unbreakable safe and then launching that safe into the darkness of outer space. Sure, the bad guy is not going to die, but trapped in a small box floating endlessly for the rest of eternity? That's a bit of a yikes punishment, Batman. Coming in at number 7, we have Batman deciding to resurrect the Joker. Batman's always been in a weird moral place with how often he's let the Joker live, and the question of how many people have died because Batman refused to end his archenemy's life is an often asked one. But when the Joker was betrayed by Ra's al Ghul and left to bleed out, Batman made the hasty decision to save his nemesis with the power of the resurrecting Lazarus pits. And while resurrecting the Joker did allow Batman to stop Ra's al Ghul's bioweapon from being unleashed, the Joker soon returned to his evil and crazy ways, leaving Batman potentially to blame for any further death and destruction the Joker might cause. Coming in at number 6, we have a Golden Age Batman highlight with the time he straight up murdered a henchman with the Batplane. Batman's earliest adventures are notable for not quite having polished out the details of the character yet, with stories featuring him using guns and being a lot less uptight about the whole no killing thing. One of the biggest examples was how Batman treated the superpowered henchmen of the villain Dr. Hugo Strange in the very first issue of his self named series. You using the Batplane's machine guns to take out a criminal truck driver before using a noose on the back of the Batplane to wrap around the neck of a genetically altered mental patient labeled as a monster. You'd think that maybe the comic would imply that Batman was just airlifting the monster somewhere else, but the narration makes it clear that nope, Batman just flat out hung a guy. The 1940s were definitely a different era. Coming in at number 5, we have Batman spying on the entire superpowered population with Brother Eye. Following an event in which Batman had his memory wiped by Zatanna and then eventually remembered it, Batman realized he would never be able to fully trust the Justice League, or any powerful metahumans for that matter. In a case of majorly overcompensating for this issue, Bruce Wayne constructed Brother Eye, an artificial intelligence housed in a secret satellite that kept tabs on every superpowered being on the planet, all without anyone knowing they were being watched. Of course, this tech would later be manipulated and abused by the villain Maxwell Lord, showing that sometimes Batman's paranoia can go a bit too far and have disastrous effects on the rest of his team. 
Coming in at number four, we've got the time Batman was the worst friend ever and slept with Barbara Gordon behind Dick Grayson's back. In the alternate future where the animated series Batman Beyond takes place, Terry McGinnis eventually found out the reason that Bruce Wayne and Dick Grayson were no longer on speaking terms. Apparently, Bruce and Barbara Gordon, the girl that Dick was absolutely crazy about, had a relationship that ended in a miscarriage while Dick was out of the city dealing with personal issues. This is some incredibly heavy stuff to put in the comic follow up to an animated children's series, and it really seems out of character for Batman. Batman to betray his protege so deeply and then handle the fallout so poorly. Whether it's iffy writing or just a really, really dark take on Bruce Wayne's personality, breaking the hearts of two people he claims to care about the most is a really, really bad look. Coming in at number three, we've got to go with Batman keeping logs on how to defeat the rest of the Justice League. During an event known as the Tower of Babel, Ra's al Ghul manipulated his daughter into giving up Batman's secret files that he had assembled on all the Justice League members and how exactly to defeat them if they ever went rogue. And while Batman claimed this was all because of the very real possibility of the team being compromised or being controlled by an enemy force, it's kind of hard to defend your choice as being the right one when Martian Manhunter was lit on fire, the Green Lantern was made blind, and Superman was poisoned with red kryptonite. Bruce Wayne may be smart, but in the hands of a villain, his plans just might be deadly. In a similar vein, coming in at number two, we have Batman hacking Cyborg the very first time they met. While this incident occurred in the alternate Injustice universe, the idea behind it is essentially the same as our last entry. Batman has a hard time trusting trusting people, and sometimes that gets revealed at the exact wrong moment. With the Justice League divided as Superman becomes a villain in this universe, Batman temporarily injures Cyborg with an electrical virus, which Cyborg quickly realizes would be impossible with his new firewalls, and then makes the realization that the virus's date signature reads as the very first week that Cyborg and Batman ever met. Ice cold, Bruce. Ice cold. And finally, coming in at number one, we have to go with Batman's treatment of Robin in the infamous series, All-Star Batman and Robin. There's always been a bit of weirdness to the dynamic of Bruce Wayne teaching a child or teenager to become a violent vigilante sidekick in his quest for justice, but this alternate universe miniseries by Frank Miller definitely takes the cake. With this version of Batman constantly verbally berating Dick Grayson with some dated language that we definitely can't use on this channel, the worst moment of all comes when Batman locks Dick inside the Batcave as some form of intense training under pressure, forcing the boy to live in pure darkness and eat rats to survive. With all the awful things Batman has done over the years, torturing this young boy who just wants to be a hero might be one of the worst. And at 10, faked Clark Kent's death. Jesus, there's a lot wrong with this number already, and we're only at number 10. <laughs> oh boy, this is bound to be a fun list. Starting off, Superman wasn't really a good person. He was nowhere near the perfect cookie cutter guy that we know today. He was actually quite toxic to Lois when things first started. Case in point, Superman's girlfriend Lois Lane. This 137 issue story features a lot of questionable moments, but one of these things is when Lois Lane disguised herself as the French actress Lois Laflamme, so that she could get close to a foreign dignitary for an interview. Superman decides that he has to teach her a lesson for using such tactics in the pursuit of a story, so he falls for Lois Laflamme as Clark Kent. When she rejects his marriage proposal, he pretends to kill himself right in front of her by jumping off a building just to make Lois feel bad. Although he claims that he's doing it as well because he needs to change into his Superman costume in midair because one of the rooms in the hotel they were on was robbed that day, but I think we all know the only reason why he did it. In at 9 prosecutes Lois. In issues 99 and 100 of Superman's girlfriend Lois Lane, we see Lois be charged with the murder of Lana Lang. Lois gets into an argument with Lana Lang when they were secretly both invited to a talk show in Gotham City to talk about how much they know Superman during Superman Appreciation Day. Like, I don't know why they're celebrating Superman in Gotham since he hardly did there, but whatever. But on the drive home, Lois and Lana get into a car crash, but only Lois makes it out alive. Batman 
Batman ends up defending her in court for some reason. Um, I mean, I, I, I really don't know why. I doubt he passed the bar. But with Batman defending her, the DA's office figures that the only man who can defeat Batman in court is Superman. <laughs> Thus, he becomes a special prosecutor and prosecutes the love of his life. I mean, he was like forced to do it, but still, what the actual hell is going on with the series? <laughs> And it ain't killed Lois. Well, the classic, oh, Superman killed Lois scene is typically pulled from the Injustice series, where Supes is tricked into killing that Lois and their unborn son by thinking they're actually Doomsday thanks to a special breed of Joker gas. I'd rather talk about the other time Lois gets killed because of Superman. By getting her pregnant. Yeah, that's right. You thought Spider-Man was the only one who had issues getting women pregnant with his radioactive swimmers? Well, the Man of Steel and the Woman of Kleenex are certainly not as good a man as some may think. Considering how in Adventures of Superman Annual Number 3, Lois gets pregnant and is then killed by the baby after getting a super-powered Kryptonian kick from inside the womb. Or at the very least a future version of her does. Which either way is still messed up as hell. Even if he didn't think it would happen, I mean like you kinda need to expect something like that. To be fair, the baby had also not really been exposed to the sun directly, so maybe he shouldn't have had powers to begin with. But I mean like, couldn't they just have kept Lois in like a chamber? with a red sun or something. I mean, I don't know. There were ways to avoid it. And it's seven desecrates Lois's grave. Yeah, that's not even the worst part about this issue. It gets worse. After finding out that Lois is going to die from their baby, Superman tried to kill himself by flying into space as far as he could from Earth. But when he does, he meets an alien warrior princess named Maxima, who he then proceeds to hook up with on Lois's grave. Which is probably the most disrespectful thing you can do on your former lover's grave, I'd think. Especially when the headstone has a line from you that reads, There can only be you, and a wreath that you had left presumably earlier that day, at least. Or if not, earlier that week. But like, yeah. That's probably one of the most problematic covers ever that features Superman. Especially at the point that it was released. I'm sure that there's been problematic things since, but... Oh. And it's six, eviction. In Superman's eighth ever appearance in Action Comics number eight, he didn't seem to really have a grip on the whole how to be a good guy thing. Since after a group of kids commits a crime to join a gang, Superman takes the gang out thinking that it will save the kids. But they don't want to reform. They just want to keep being bad. Probably because of the whole like the gang is the only people who care about me kind of thing or something like that, right? That's usually the line. Well, want to know how Superman fixes that? Not by sending them to jail or getting the cops to take him for some kind of scared straight thing. No, he instead gets an idea from a hurricane and starts tearing the poor neighborhood apart. Yeah, thinking that when he's done, the town will be rid of its quote, filthy crime festering slums. I mean, I guess it kind of worked in a way since the government ends up rebuilding modern apartment units there that are definitely too expensive for the previous residents. So the crime does leave because the, the people have to leave as well. Huh. Halfway through in at number 5, Exposed Batman. While this seems like something that any version of Superman would do if they turned bad, it's actually interesting to see that only the Injustice version of Superman did it. Yeah, after getting fed up with Batman leading the resistance against his totalitarian regime, Superman tells the world that Batman is really Bruce Wayne. How does he do this, you ask? Like a press conference, or like a worldwide news message, or video maybe? Nope, none of the above. This dude freaking outs him on Twitter. Superman, in just four simple words, tells the world that Batman is Bruce Wayne. Using those four words, actually. From the official Superman Twitter account, by the way. Dude doesn't even use his Clark Kent Twitter. Man. He's still hiding behind his identity, but then decides to out Bruce's. It's a damn shame. With over 2.5 million retweets and over 3.5 million favorites, this was certainly number one on trending for sure. At least until Kim K posted a pic in like a Batman costume to capitalize on the news, pushing the actual Bruce Wayne is Batman thing to number two on trending. That's probably what would have happened. Let's be honest. And it for World War II propaganda. When World War II was ongoing, a load of the population turned to superheroes to provide hope. This is where we got Captain America and more. But this also turned Superman into the noble American hero that we know him for today. However, that caused him to be a little more on the, the prejudice side of things in his material. It was mostly to encourage able-bodied men to enlist and others to buy war bonds to fund their soldiers. But my question is, why did you have to lean so hard into the whole race thing? 
mean, really, DC? Like, Superman was literally printing posters that said things like, Superman says you can slap a Japanese soldier with war bonds and stamps, with a very stereotypical drawing on them, as, as well as some offensive slurs. So, yeah, that's pretty messed up. They also did this to avoid having Superman just, like, straight up end the war, because, like, let's be honest, if he was fighting, there would be no war. They came up with various excuses for it, too, like Clark Kent accidentally using his x-ray vision to read the wrong eye chart while trying to enlist, resulting in him being rejected. Getting close to the end, in number three, made a film with his friend's wife. A lot of people make fun of the adult film industry, okay? But honestly, it's the backbone of the economy, at least in some cases. However, Superman has never shied away from helping small business owners, especially in Action Comics number 592 and 593. That's right, before Kim K had her go at it, Superman tried the whole celebrity tape thing, with the help of a character named Sleaze, one of Darkseid's former enforcers. Superman tracks down a missing new god, Big Barda, to Metropolis' roughest neighborhood, the Suicide Slum. There, Superman discovers that not only has Barda been brainwashed by Sleaze, but the Apocalypse native is using her to produce a line of popular adult films. Superman tries to rescue her, but ultimately falls under Sleaze's control as well. And Sleaze does exactly what you would expect. He becomes Sleazy. He takes Barda and Superman to the local videographer and makes some naughty videos. <laughs> then her husband walks in. It's certainly an interesting couple issues. Penultimately, in a number two, Executioner. Nowadays, Superman doesn't really kill, aside from a few moments, Man of Steel and Injustice most notably. However, there wasn't really an origin for this moral code. We just kind of assumed that he was a good guy that didn't want to kill. However, writer John Byrne wanted to answer that unasked question in Superman number 22, one of the most controversial Superman stories ever. In this issue, Superman finds himself in a pocket dimension where a group of three Kryptonian soldiers had wiped out all life on Earth, with the exception of Bruce Wayne, Lex Luthor, and a synthetic life form that was calling itself Supergirl. They try to fight the criminals, but they're not really a match for them, which results in Supes taking some unexpected actions. He exposes the group, which also included an alternate reality version of General Zod, to golden kryptonite of their world, resulting in them permanently losing their powers, and him keeping his since it wasn't kryptonite from his world, it was from their pocket dimension. But Zod still threatens Superman and says that you'll track him down and destroy his Earth, even though he literally has no powers. But instead of just abandoning them on a dead planet, it, Supes thinks that that's not enough, so then he kills them with kryptonite. However, he is still grief-stricken and then promises that he will never kill again. My question is, why'd you have to pull out the green kryptonite if you already took away the powers? Couldn't you just have, like... Finally, in at number one, ruled the world. <laughs> oh boy. Usually when people talk about ruling the world and Superman, they talk about injustice again. And while this is a great story and an example of what can go wrong with superheroes, the story of King of the World is also a good cautionary tale about Superman. In the late 90s, this story featured a series of prophetic dreams that make Superman realize that his regular MO, just flying around and waiting for disasters to happen, isn't really working. And Kal-El decides to be a little more proactive. However, to him, that means building a series of spy satellites to survey Earth, helping Superman keep track of everything that's happening at once, all over the globe, and giving up his life as Clark Kent to work as Superman full time. Sleep deprived and losing his grip on humanity, as well as his sanity, Superman starts to interfere more and more with Earth's affairs, toppling extremist governments and even changing the weather. But when he realizes that he can't be everywhere at once because, you know, it's the whole world, the Man of Steel deploys an army of Superman robots to help maintain law and order, effectively making Superman a benevolent dictator, <sighs> only snapping out of it when he gets a kiss from Lois Lane. This is what happened, okay, this is what No Nut November will do to the weak minded, okay? Superman wouldn't stand a chance, also I find it funny how he made flying robots, because the Man of Steel made Men of Steel. <laughs> Number 10, killed his lover's brother. I mean, granted, his lover Clara Creed's brother Saul did set him up to be recaptured by Mr. Sinister. And yes, I did say Creed. This was established in the comic Origins Number 2. It was here that we learned that Clara, Victor Creed's sister, was once the lover of Wolverine. Saul became jealous of Wolverine's close relationship with his sister, and so he decided to sell him out to Sinister. Well, him and her. Clara was seemingly killed by Essex, but recovered due to her healing factor and 
Wolverine later realized the truth that Saul was the one who had sold them out. In a fit of rage, he drowned Saul Creed in a vat of liquid in Sinister's lair. The same liquid that Essex planned to use on Logan to wipe his mind clean. Despite the fact that Saul was not really a great person, Wolverine still did not need to kill him here and continued to drown him even as Clara begged Logan to stop hurting her brother. Wolverine killing Saul was also what would be explained as the reason why Sabretooth visits him every year on his birthday to torment him and fight him. That was what Victor used to do apparently to his little brother Saul every year. Because Victor could no longer punish Saul, he instead decided to punish the man who took his little brother away from him. It's like a weird, like, I loved my brother because I loved beating him up. Number 9. Didn't lift a finger to save a kid. Later on, when a very young prisoner of war was about to be shot upon his release by the rebel faction that Wolverine was working with, Logan did not do anything to stop it. Granted, he did figure that Eric, who had agreed to take care of that prisoner, Jamie, would do the right thing. Jamie was seemingly freed by his captors, but this was all to give him one last moment of joy before they took his life. They were like, yeah, yeah, you can go free, and then they're like, now we'll, now we'll shoot him. Fortunately, while Eric took on the burden of killing Jamie, he actually did this so that he would be sure that the boy would truly go free, pretending to have missed the shot, allowing young Jamie to escape. Eric, by the way, is also the well-known author George Orwell, which is his pen name. This is a gloriously weird story that this point comes from, as evident by the fact that yeah, George Orwell is in the story. This act or lack thereof comes to us from issue 36 of the 1988 Wolverine series. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want more lists about Wolverine, I love talking about Wolverine, so be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. More mutant lists. Blah! Number 8. Killed a newly powered mutant. The newly powered mutant in question doesn't even have a name and is a high school kid. This of course all went down in the Ultimate Universe, which is a much harsher and gritty world by comparison to the Earth of 616. Still, Wolverine kills the kid who had just learned he is a mutant because it had been deemed that that kid is too dangerous. His powers allow him to basically vaporize people in his vicinity, and you get to see it happen in this issue as well, and I will say it's pretty brutal. It's like he, he like burns people sort of from the inside out, is what it looks like. Without meaning to, this kid vaporized all the people in his hometown, including his own family and his girlfriend. Rather than try to help this poor kid, it's decided the best thing for all of mutant kind, though maybe not this youngster himself, is for him to die. Wolverine is sent on a mission to deal with this new mutant. He talks to the kid and does his best to explain sort of what's going on and what's going to happen. He isn't a cold hearted killer after all, but he also still goes through with the mission without even seeming to question if it's the right thing to do. I mean, come on Wolverine. It's just a kid. The two mutants go up to a cave in the evening and Wolverine gives him a beer and explains the whole situation. And in the morning, only Wolverine leaves the cave, implying the despicable deed has been done. Also, this kid never even got a name. Number seven, kidnapped a nun. Now granted, Wolverine did this to actually try and help a recurring rival of his from back in Madripoor, Roughhouse. Roughhouse, you see, had been taken by the evil cyborg Geist, who had been around since World War II and had a history of working for villainous world leaders, including the Fuhrer. Geist had taken Roughhouse to use him for experimentation as he was trying to use a very intense type of Kane to turn Roughhouse into a hero for the nation of Terra Verde, and more specifically its militaristic and villainous ruler at the time, President Karadid. However, the cocaine had some alarming side effects, and that's why Wolverine kidnapped the nun. She was a healer known as Sister Salvation, who was actually once the wife of the president before seeing the sins of her lifestyle and her husband and renouncing her marriage and becoming a nun as a result. Sister Salvation was the only one who could calm Roughhouse's unbridled rage and heal his disfigurement, symptoms of the cocaine. It's actually even implied that Sister Salvation may have been a mutant this whole time. But anyways, so even though she had done nothing wrong, Wolverine took her with them by force so that Sister Salvation could help keep Roughhouse in check. This all went down in issues 20 to 21 of the 1988 series of Wolverine. Also, I love this entire story, so you should go read it. Is good. Number six, killed Hank Pym. Of course, he had a pretty good reason to do so, and this wasn't actually main continuity Hank Pym. This was a Hank Pym from a time when Wolverine had time traveled back to in order to prevent the creation of Ultron to begin with, killing Hank of Earth 26111 before he could bring Ultron into existence. Time travel. Unfortunately, although he had good intentions here, Wolverine actually made everything even worse by doing this. And while the disaster that was Ultron was avoided, worse ones quickly popped up in his 
place. Enter Morgan Le Fay's magics versus Tony Stark's science. This all went down in the Age of Ultron series with Wolverine killing Hank in issue number 6 with the aftermath spilling out into the following issues. Also this is just another reason to just be like hey don't do time travel. It usually doesn't work out. Just don't do it. If you're like maybe I'll time travel to fix everything. No. I've read too many comics about this. I've seen too many movies. It's gonna be a bad idea overall. Except for maybe Back to the Future. Although it goes wrong and then it usually goes right by the end. Comedies. Number 5. Killed his childhood sweetheart. Now granted Wolverine didn't mean to kill Rose, it just kinda happened, but he still did it. Rose was Logan's childhood friend and sweetheart back when he was known as James Howlett. When James left his family home which was tragically torn asunder, Rose went with him. Eventually she was courted by a man who wanted to marry her and she agreed, breaking young Wolvie's heart. Ouch. In the end however, Logan was drawn back into a fight with his former friend slash rival growing up. Dog. Dog had returned to kill Logan and seemingly also do harm to Rose or take her with him or some other terrible thing. The two got into a fight and it came to the point where Logan was about to kill Dog. Not wanting Logan to be a murderer, Rose urged him to stop, heading towards him and in the midst of a panicked crowd, tripping and stumbling as she rushed to his side and becoming impaled on his bone claws. How tragic. Even Logan was aware of how terrible this was. What's worse is it seemed like Rose the whole time actually had loved him. I mean they were kind of pretending to be cousins at this point so it was kind of a thing where they were like maybe we both have feelings but we can't be together. Rose died and Logan lost his mind turning feral under the weight of what he had done. This all went down in backstory series Wolverine the origin with Rose's death happening in issue number 6. Number 4. Put moves on MJ. This one went down in the ultimate universe but although it wasn't 616 Wolverine who was responsible, it was still a Wolverine. Just the Wolverine of Earth 1610 instead. In the ultimate universe at one point Wolverine and Spider-Man swapped bodies. This all happens because, well, Jean is mad at Logan, which is maybe one of the most despicable things that Jean has done, making Wolverine swap bodies with someone that he hates, but I guess we'll save that for our Jean Grey version of this list. While their bodies are swapped, it turns out Wolverine got some alone time with Mary Jane while in Peter's body. We later learn, once the two heroes have swapped back, that Logan in Peter's body attempted to put the moves on MJ and even tried to sleep with the young lady, which is pretty despicable for like a long list of reasons. And I don't think I have to go into them because I think you know what they are. Number 3. Trying to shame the Punisher. Which admittedly doesn't sound that despicable. Like on paper, trying to shame someone doesn't sound that bad. Until you understand the whole context in which Logan tried to shame Frank here. This really comes down to a sort of comic book writer feud. Wherein Frank Thierry, longtime writer on the Wolverine series, decided to get back at Garth Ennis for his brutal rendition of the fight that happened between Wolverine and the Punisher in his own Punisher run. Ennis's fight happened in Punisher issue 17 back in the 2001 series. That fight really only started because Punisher made fun of Wolverine's height. Their team up there also started with them taking on a group of people with dwarfism. And then of course ends with Wolverine getting steamrolled by Frank. And I mean literally steamrolled with a steamroller. To get revenge though, Frank Thierry sank pretty low. At the end of his fight with the two heroes in issue 186 of Wolverine, he has Wolverine discover Punisher's bodybuilding mags. And basically makes fun of him for having them and trying to shame the Punisher because he believes that he's gay. That's, I mean that's pretty awful. Now granted, Wolverine in the present day is a proud parent of Akihiro, aka Dokken, his openly bisexual son. So obviously I don't think this writing reflects the modern day character, but like, yeesh. is a pretty bad, it was a weird, it was a weird time friends. Number 2. Drowned his own son in a puddle. Speaking of Akihiro, I mean exactly what I just said is really what happened here. Granted like so many awful things that Wolverine has done on this list, this one also wasn't directly his fault. He and his son Dokken aka Akihiro were manipulated by Sabretooth which is what led to this moment. The most tragic element of this whole thing is that he knew what he was doing was wrong and sadly just spent time reflecting on what his life could have been like with Dokken if he had actually been able to grow up with his father around. They could have had a beautiful relationship instead of hating and wanting to kill one another. Wolverine thinks on this, imagining what their lives could have been like all while drowning Dokken in a puddle. If you want to see this heartbreaking horror show of this son versus dad battle, check out issue 34 of the first volume of Uncanny X-Force which started in 2010. Also I believe that's Rick Remender and Phil Noto and you know I love Phil Noto and also Remender's done some pretty cool stuff so it's a good one but a tragic one. Number one forgot about his kids then killed them. Never mind. 
Wolverine just killing Akihiro, who admittedly in the past has also been pretty evil, so as awful as that was, there was still kind of an element to that where it almost, almost felt fair. It was still sad, but you were like, I mean, he's kind of a bad guy. But Wolverine's fights against his children is not a saga that ends there. In fact, there was another time in the comics where Doc and I actually pitted his dad against his fellow half-siblings, all children of Wolverines that he either never knew about or had forgotten as a side effect of his healing powers and his super long lifespan. This team was brought together by Dawkin and he called them the Mongrels. Or well, brought together by Dawkin and the red right hand at least called them the Mongrels. They came together to take on their father with Dawkin training them for the fight. In the end, however, Wolverine defeated them, killing them all. Now this of course is a win-win scenario for Dawkin though, because either they killed Wolverine, his own father and enemy, or they ended up killed, which meant that Dawkin would also have a part in hurting his dad just by revealing the truth of the team members and how they were all his kids. Really though, the greater organization behind this whole plot was was the red right hand, who only wanted Wolverine to suffer as they had. They were united by the fact that they'd all lost family members to Logan, who had killed them at one point or another in his very long life. Which is why they pit him against his own unknown children before taking their own lives. They were like, we don't even want you to die, we just want you to hurt people that you once loved or could have loved. You know how it is. And Wolverine doesn't even know, because he's like, I don't even know who these people are. And then later finds out and is like, oh gosh, oh boy, my life is terrible.